I'm here with a man who needs no introduction to Real Vision viewers. Jim Ricketts, thanks so much for finding the time to do this with me. Thanks, man. Great to be with you. It's, it's been a while. Wait, I've been dying to talk to you for some time now because you're a voice that I've heard in my ear for a number of years now. And in a world like the Goldwood, and we'll get to God, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about first. It's very rare to meet a pragmatist and someone that can just be reasonably calm and sanguine and talk sensibly about stuff that people get a lot of emotion about. But before we get to go, there's something I really want to talk to you about, and that's the currency wars. Because sure. you were one of the first guys who crystallized this idea of currency wars back in 2011, I think. It was. 2011, my book came out, yeah, Currency Wars. Where do we stand with that? Because people were denying it was taking place. I think it's fairly unequivocal now. But just give us an update on the currency wars it stands. Well, when international monetary elites have to deny something 30 or 40 times, <laughs> it's probably good evidence that it's true. But, uh, but one of the points I made in the book, uh, and it, it's held up very well, is that we're not always in a currency war. Um, I identify what I call currency war one from 1921 to, uh, to 1936 and currency war two from 1967 to 1987. Those dates are not completely arbitrary, yeah. but you can fade them a little bit, but those are periods of definite currency wars. And, and we're in a new one that began in 2010 and uh, the book came out in 2011. I started writing about it in 2010. But the point I make is you're not always in a currency war, but when you are, they can go on for five or 10 or 15 years, or in, in the case of the currency war, uh, to 20 years. So I'm not the least bit surprised that here we are in 2016 going into 2017, and the currency war is still going on. I said, hey, it's only five years old, they're six years old. This could easily go on for another four years. And, but there's a reason for that. The reason is they don't have a logical conclusion. Uh, so it's just, you know, you devalue your currency because you're trying to, you know, the conventional wisdom is you devalue your currency to promote exports, to create export related jobs, you know, reduce your trade deficit, increase your GDP. Those are all, those all sound like really good things. So we cheapen the dollar and, uh, you know, you're Indonesia and you need to buy an aircraft and you don't make them. And you really have two choices. You got Boeing and Airbus. So you cheapen the dollar relative to the euro. All of a sudden that Boeing plane looks a little mm -hmm. more attractive. You buy one, there's jobs in Seattle or St. Louis or whatever, and, and you kind of go from there. That's the conventional story. There are two problems with that. Number one, that's not why central banks are cheapening their currencies. They're cheapening their currencies to import inflation. The U.S. is a net importer. We buy more than we sell. So when you have a cheap dollar, okay, a Boeing aircraft or General Electric uh, wind turbine gets a little less expensive, but all the stuff we buy gets more expensive because we're paying for it in cheaper dollars, and that's what the central bankers really want. They want those price increases to feed through the supply chain and try to create inflation because governments around the world are desperate to get inflation. It's a, uh, you know, it's a sad day when, when a central bank wants inflation and can't get it. Right. I call it a... Uh, Mick Jaggernomics uh, after Mick Jagger, uh, you can't always because you, you can't always get what yeah. you want. So, um, so that's the real reason they do it, and it can have a short-term impact. It can help exports a little bit. It can give you a little bit of lift. But the problem is, it comes at the expense of the trading partners. This is just classic beggar by neighbor uh, devaluations. That's what currency wars are. So it can help individual country growth, but it does nothing for world growth. The world is no better off. Mm -hmm. One country is a little better off, another country is worse off. So the other metaphor I've used is, uh, you know, you've got four soldiers and they're fighting and it's a hot day and they get a break and they've got one canteen and they're all really thirsty. What do you do in that situation? You pass the canteen. In other words, everybody would like to drink the whole canteen, but you take a sip, you hand it to your mate, he takes a sip and so forth. And that's the way the currency wars have gone. 2009 was the, the day of the cheap yuan. Remember, 2009, 2010, Secretary Geithner couldn't get out of bed without complaining yeah. about Chinese currency manipulation. 2011, the dollar hit an all-time low on a couple of indices. That was the cheap dollar. 2013, along comes Abenomics, and one of his three arrows was a cheap yen. All of a sudden, the yen's at 120, 124. Japan got a little bit of a lift. So who's suffering the whole time? Europe. Europe had the strong currency, two recessions in four years. So finally, 2015, it was Draghi's turn. Well, 2000, June 2014, they launched negative interest rates. In January 2015, they launched European QE. So, so you're going from China, US, Japan, Europe, everybody's passing the canteen. But the world is still stuck in basically depressionary growth. It's not, we don't have negative growth, but we have below trend growth. So there is no way out of it. You, you, right, so right now, my forecast, I actually said this a couple of months ago, is that look for uh, a stronger yen, stronger euro, cheaper dollar, cheaper yuan. That has played out with a couple speed bumps. The dollar got a big lift because of Brexit. 
uh, and Europe, the euro went down a little bit also because of Brexit. Uh, but the yen went from 124 to 104. It backed up, 103 actually backed up a little bit. Uh, but we, we do have a strong yen. Uh, all these people who expect Japan to intervene in currency markets, don't hold your breath. They've been warned, I would say threatened, by Jack Lew and Christine Lagarde. Don't you dare mm -hmm. intervene in currency markets. You're just, you, you, know, you had three years with a cheap yen. You didn't make the structural reforms. You didn't know, do what you needed to do. Too bad for you, we're taking the canteen back. So, so the point to your, to, to your main question, Grant, is that they don't have a logical conclusion. There are only two ways out of a currency war. One is systemic reform, a kind of Bretton Woods mm -hmm. or a Plaza Accord where all the major powers sit down and just say, here's the new deal. The other one is systemic collapse. I expect collapse. Um, because there's no consensus on a way out of it. There's no political will behind structural reform. Uh, I don't see the leadership, you know, in, uh, you know, in 1944, you had John Maynard Keynes. In 1985, you had James Baker. In the 1990s, you had Bob Rubin. These were, you know, whether the Democrats or Republicans, these, this was leadership. I don't see that kind of leadership yeah. today. I see a lot of denial. I don't see the political will behind structural reform. So I would expect a collapse of the system. But it's interesting because you know, that idea of a collapse of the system, when we supposedly came close in 08, mm -hmm. nobody really knows what a, a collapse in the system looks like anymore because we, we can go back to Bretton Woods and say, okay, that was the last reset we had. We can look at that and pick it apart, but it's so much different now. The basics were still the same. I, I, I totally agree with all your points about the currencies. But that idea of a collapse in the system frightens people. And when they hear someone with your gravitas talking about it, it frightens them even more because generally it's tub thumpers who talk about stuff like that. What's the reception you get when you talk about that systemic collapse? Not necessarily to people at conferences, or, but when you talk to officials and people in power, what's their grasp of that? Well, it's interesting you say, you know, because of all the bailouts, we don't know what a systemic collapse looks like. I actually have a pretty good idea of what it looks like because there was Everyone focuses on 2008 and, you know, U.S. economists call it the Great Recession. You go abroad, they call it the uh, Global Financial Crisis, the GFC for yeah. sure, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we had another one that was actually potentially worse or as bad uh, in 1998. And that was the uh, Asian financial crisis. It started in 97, worked its way around the world, ended up in Russia, and then landed in my lap at long-term capital management. I was the general counsel of that hedge fund in Greenwich uh, that got bailed out by Wall Street, although I'd like to remind people they didn't bail us out, they bailed themselves out because sure. we owed them a trillion dollars. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's an important point, though, I think, right. isn't it? Yeah, no, Wall Street bailed itself out. I, yeah. I always say, you know, hey, we owed, we owed, on paper, we owed Wall Street a trillion dollars in derivatives trades. If we had failed, meaning filed for bankruptcy, and we had a bankruptcy team ready to file those papers in, in the Cayman Islands because we were a Cayman fund, um, I said, well, we, I would have just slept in the next day. It's like, I, it's out of my head. We filed for bankruptcy, good luck getting your money. Wall Street bailed themselves out because they didn't want that trillion dollars of derivatives positions dumped on them. Then they would have to turn to the market and yeah. dump it. We were hours away from the closure of every major market in the world. It's not an exaggeration. Uh, Greenspan testified to that. Uh, Ruben said the same thing. It would have started in Tokyo, gone through London, ended up in New York. But every stock exchange, bond market in the world would have been shut down, at least temporarily, to deal with it. That's how bad it would have been. L Lehman would have failed in 98. Forget, right. forget about it. Right. They, they were always the weakest link right. in the chain. It was easy to call in 2008 because <laughs> they almost failed in 98. But the point is, okay, so we moved $4 billion in cash in about three days. If you think of it as a private deal, $4 billion all cash, no due diligence, wire the money. That's kind of how <laughs> the sense of urgency. And so we filmed the runways, we brought it in for landing, you know, nobody, the plane didn't crash or break up on the runway, but it was that close. So when 2008 came along, I just felt I was watching a movie I had already seen. It was like a rerun right. for me. Uh, and you're right, 2008 was even bigger, potentially more. We were, if not hours, maybe days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in the world, uh, starting with, uh, you know, Bear had already gone out, uh, Fannie, Freddie, Lehman, AIG, Morgan Stanley would have been next, then Goldman, then Merrill's City, yep. yeah, Mer et cetera. The, we, were, we were days away from that. And again, I think Andrew O'Sorkin did a good job yep. in his book. So, so this isn't, we're not looking at strike two in a baseball metaphor, we're looking at strike three because 98 was strike one, 2008 was strike two. Now we're looking at strike three. The next one is gonna be worse. So, what, so I think we've, we've come extremely close. I think people are overly complacent just because we, bail, we, we managed to pull off bailouts and the world didn't come to an end. Don't assume it wasn't close and don't assume it won't happen again. Sure, but, no, there's, sure. but there's one very important difference. 
1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In 2018, let's say, keep up the 10-year tempo, who's going to bail out the central banks? And all we do is we move the problem to a different balance sheet. Now the problem is on the central bank balance sheet. Because the Fed printed $3.4 trillion of new money since 2008. Their balance sheet was $800 billion. Now it's at $4.2 trillion, give or take, so $3.4 uh, you know, trillion of new money. But it's nine years on. Yeah. They haven't normalized. If they had somehow got their balance sheet back to $800 billion, I'd say, okay, you guys could do that again. But when you're at $4 trillion, what are you going to do when the next crisis hits, which could be soon, by the way? Go to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? Now, some people say, yeah, what's the problem? Just print more money. I had my doubts about that. But so who can bail out central banks? The answer is the IMF because they have the only clean balance sheet left in the world. The Fed is leveraged about 113 mm-hmm. to 1 uh, with a duration mismatch. So they look like a really bad hedge fund. And again, <laughs> I've spoken to central bankers who say, well, who cares? Central banks don't need capital. A, a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve said that to me. She said, central banks don't need capital. I said, well, that's one point of view. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, but we'll see. <laughs> exactly, we'll see. Um, but there's, there's sort of an invisible, uh, hard to define confidence boundary. And when you cross that confidence boundary, and everyday citizens just wake up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm checking out of this system. You tell me it's all good. I don't believe you anymore. Yeah. And get me some gold because I know that the gold will be around, et cetera. That's an instantaneous loss of confidence in the dollars. That's what I mean by collapse. Now, I, now, just to be clear, I don't think we'll all be living in caves, right. eating canned goods, you know, lighting fires with with rocks and, and twigs. Uh, you know, life will go on. You know, this, but it'll but it'll be different. The dollar will maybe be like the Mexican peso in the sense of being a, a local currency that you get when you go to the United yeah. States, but no longer the world currency. They'll try to bail it out with SDRs, the special drawing rights. Um, if it works, if the SDR bailout works, it's only because nobody understands it, or like maybe there were 100 people in the world who really understand. I've spoken to PhD monetary economists, like, like people right in the field with PhDs from Harvard who can't give you a straight explanation of what an SDR is. So, uh, so if it works, it'll only be because nobody gets it. But I have a feeling that because of social media, because of you know, interviews like the ones you do, Grant, just because of different means of communication, that people will get it and they'll run for gold because it's money good. And so that, uh, and, then, and then you get into coercion, shutting down banks, closing ATMs, or maybe reprogramming repro- ATMs. Everyone can have $300 a day for gas and groceries, but mm-hmm. no more. Um, recently, the SEC has changed the rules for money market funds. You know, I, I meet people everywhere and, you, and I say, well, how much money you got? Where do you have your money in? Probably a better way to put it. And they go, I got, I got a lot. I got money in stocks, money in bonds, money in real estate, and money in the money market funds. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks, bonds, and real estate. You don't have money in anything. That's yeah. not money. Oh, I can sell it and get the money. Really? Uh, maybe not. Maybe they'll close the New York Stock Exchange. But anyway, they have new rules on money market funds where money market funds can suspend redemptions. Now that has always been true of hedge funds. I've never seen a hedge fund right. offering document that didn't have that in there. But people think they can call Charles Schwab or you know Merrill Lynch or Bank of America, instruct the broker to sell the units, and the money's in the bank the next day. They're going to wake up one day and make that phone call and find out, no, we've, we've suspended redemptions. We'll get back to you. You can't get your money. And oh, by the way, the day that will happen is the same day you want your money the most. Yeah, and those, it's, condi- it's conditionally correlated. So this is... So you'll still have money for gas and groceries and your kids will still go to school and you'll still have food on the table, but you won't be able to get your money. The IMF will be flooding the zone with trillions of SDRs. The dollar will be greatly devalued relative to SDRs. It'll be like Mexican pesos and then it'll be a very different world. It seems to me, you know, the more I think about this, I spend a lot of time thinking about trying to figure it all out, but this can't get structurally fixed without a massive transfer of wealth. Somewhere that right. has to take place. Correct. It's either got to be written off or it's got to be taken from the people that have it to plug the holes amongst the people that don't. Right. And so when you look at this and you look at it going and you look at all the fake money that's being printed on top just to keep this event, this transfer from happening, mm-hmm. once we get to the IMF, I think you're right, what you said about confidence is so crucial because that to me is the only thing that's holding this whole thing together. Now. It is that confidence. Right. I believe it's misplaced. I believe the day when people understand that is drawing close. You can see it. Mm-hmm. You can see it in. I think that's right. In the in the reaction to Corona going negative, you saw the instant reaction. The knee jerk 
gut reaction of the markets was to go completely the opposite direction, the mm -hmm. stocks and the bonds. How close are we to that tipping point, do you think, where confidence goes? Are we, are we Donald Trump away? Are we, you know, wh wh what do you think we might be? We could be. Um, the, I've spent a lot of time uh, studying the science of uh, complexity theory, but there are related branches. There's complexity theory, graph theory, network theory, um, branches of physics, applied mathematics. So there, there's a lot of science behind this. So when I, when I talk about this, I'm not just kind of throwing out glib, sure. you know, predictions of doom and gloom. You know, you get accused of that all the time. But I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about. It. So the, the the rigorous correct answer is that you never know, and that's a very unsatisfying answer because people go. And I almost get the the version of the question. Hey, Jim, you call, call me at 3.30 the day before. Right, right. I'll sell my stocks right. and get some gold and I'll be all good. I said, look, I'm not going to know. You're not going to know. But what are you waiting for? If that's in the cards, which it is, and if that's a prospect, and if it could happen tomorrow, I'm not saying it will, but it could, what are you waiting for? Why don't you get your gold now? Because here's the point. When this happens, and it can happen very quickly, you're actually not going to be able to get gold. You're going to you're going to see the price of gold going up a hundred dollars a day per ounce, and then two hundred. It you know it it'll like struggle its way to fourteen hundred dollars an ounce, and then it struggle its way to fourteen fifty, and all of a sudden, boom, fifteen fifty, seventeen fifty, nineteen hundred, twenty five. It's going to go like that because that, that's how these things play out. And then somebody go, oh, I get it. I, I heard I should get some gold. And you're going to call your broker, and you're going to find out the brokers are out of stock. The mints back ordered. Uh, the the gov premiums the are doubled. The, yeah. premium, the government's intervening, uh, and you're, you're not going to be able to get it. So get it now while you still can. I mean, there's a, a people ask me how the war on cash is going. I say, well, don't worry about it. The government won. You know, the, the war on cash is over. Yeah. People actually think they can get cash. You can't. Yeah. Not without being treated like a drug dealer or a criminal. Absolutely. So, so the government won the war on cash, and they're, they're mopping up operations with digital money in Sweden, and that's going to, and negative interest rates, that, that's going to keep coming. But you can actually still buy gold. There are very few restrictions on it. That will change. There'll be a war on gold yeah. to tag along with the war on cash. But um, I mean, going back to you, one of your earlier questions, Grant, is when, when you actually talk to central bankers and PhD economists and policymakers, and I do have occasion to do that, um, they kind of fall into one of two camps. A lot of them just can't even process what I'm saying. Like I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them exactly the way I'm talking to you. Yeah. Say exactly the same thing, and they 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 can't process it. They're what are you talking about? It's not, there's not even like disagreement. You know, I like disagreement because if I'm missing something, I want sure. someone to tell me that. But they don't even disagree that like this conversation is going anywhere because gold is a joke or a barbarous relic or what do you, or, or uh, I, I won't mention the name, but I, I had a conversation with a senior treasury official and uh, we were in a, like a war game, you know, down in Washington, financial warfare strategy session. And I said something you know, along the lines, we we're talking about, about SDRs and the IMF and this, Again, senior treasury official said, um, he here often said, look, the dollar is the global reserve currency, has been for a long time and always will be. And I said to this gentleman, I said, you know, I feel like I'm in Whitehall in 1913 <laughs> listening to, you <laughs> right. know, John Bull say uh, sterling is the reserve currency and always will be. Well, that might have seemed true in 1913, but by 1914 they were done and then it took a few years to play out after that. And sterling today is a minor and yeah. it's technically reserve currency, but it's been grossly devalued since then and doesn't play a big role in the international financial system. So I, I feel, like I guess I was in Whitehall in 1913 looking into the abyss and no one else knew that they were going to walk off the cliff. So they can't process it. There are others, I would say, much more sophisticated, much more knowledgeable, who would, if they were a third party in this conversation, they would mentally agree with everything we're saying, but they can't say it. Yeah. They can't. Can you imagine Christine Lagarde saying, you know, people, let, let me just give you the straight scoop. This whole system is hanging by a thread. Sure. Uh, the, the central banks are broke. Um, sovereigns cannot possibly pay off their debt. Um, we're going to have to, like, flood the zone with SDRs when the time comes, and it's going to inflate all these currencies, and your, all your wealth is going to... She can't say that, but she knows it. Interesting thing about Lagarde, she's not an economist. She's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so am I. So you, you, lawyers are trained. People dislike lawyers because they're like trained to think a certain way. But it's a great analytical tool, and she's got that. She's got those chops, so she knows. Uh, she knows what's going on. I haven't spoken to her personally, but I've spoken to like number two official and very senior people at the IMF and and monetary staff economists, and and a lot of them get it, but they just can't talk about it. So there's either. Um, 
blissful ignorance or intentional denial. Yeah. Uh, sort of one or the other. So what about just switching topics a little bit? Um, Brexit. Was that, to me it wasn't a huge surprise, but I think that's because I'm British. And so I kind of understand <laughs> that fractious dynamic between the UK and Europe. Was that as big a deal as people are making it out to be at the time? It's softened. Are, are, the, are the echoes still waiting to be heard? And what do you think those echoes will be? That's a great question. I think it was an extremely big deal at the time. I was actually in um, in the UK in the days leading up to it. I left London, I think, the, the, the night of the 20th, the 21st. But I was, I was doing some interviews. And, and I was in, uh, we actually were able to get the London Eye, you know, the, the right. Ferris wheel. And uh, we, had, we had a film crew and we went in and uh, they said, okay, you can have two turns. You can have your own capsule, they call it. You can have two turns. So you, know, you never saw a crew set up and break down faster than get in. <laughs> and I was literally, I was in the London Eye on June 20th, uh, three days before the vote, with Big Ben and Houses of Parliament behind me and a nice London fog. And I was almost, you know, I try not to get hyperbolic, but this trade screamed at me. I said, uh, you know, the vote was actually too close to call. It was close, so it turned out to be a comfortable margin for leave. I, it's not that I was putting a stake in the ground on Lee, but I was saying Ster, the market is fully priced. Yeah, the re- asymmetry remain. was the a, the asymmetry. Yeah. The, Sterling's at 150, gold's at 1260. I said, that is 110% price for Remain. So if Remain wins, if you, if you short Sterling and buy gold, which is what I was recommending, I said, if Remain wins, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to lose any money because it's, it's fully priced. But if Lee wins, Boom! You're just you're going to make so much money so fast, and that's exactly what happened. And I've you know I've had uh, I don't know people on social media or email. They 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 told me they said we we listened to you and thank you. You paid for my kids' college this year. I mean, seriously, because right. they sure. like okay, sure, it's sterling buy uh, buy gold and uh, okay. So then and then you had to kind of get out of that. I'm not a day trader, but you know I, that one was that was clear. Yeah. Um, People made that my sitting out right. Things have come back a little bit. Although gold didn't go back down to no. 1260, it came down to 1310. It seems to have a comfortable floor around 1320, 1330. So that didn't come all the way back. Same thing with sterling. It came up from the dollar 20 level, but it's like a dollar 31. So they haven't come back all the way. But uh, but there does seem to be complacency about it, as we were you know, talking earlier about the system as a whole. I think it's a very big deal, and I and I so I think this is going to play out over the next year or so. We're not going to know all the effects right away. I mean, we've already had a change of government in the UK. Uh, now, the Scots are talking about a new referendum. I saw an article uh, by uh, our friend Anatol Koletsky, uh, the, who, wo- who wor- works for, uh, uh, not, not that there's anything wrong with this, but he works for a think tank that's financed by George Soros. So he's kind of a smart guy, but he's kind of a, you know, a, espousing the Soros line. So he wants a do-over. He's like, well, why not? You know, this is a really bad result. Let's have another vote. That's not going to fly with the with the British people. But when I was in London that week, uh, you know, I talked to, uh, you know, pub keepers, taxi drivers, shopkeepers. I I didn't find one person who wanted uh, to remain. Right. Not one. Now I'm in England. Right? I'm not in Scotland. But um, that was striking to me that I couldn't find anyone who 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 thought they should remain. Uh, the trade was, you know, they're not always easy. But this one was was just very clear. Um, but I would go back to 1998, because 1998, that crisis, that was August, September 1998. That was Russia. Russia defaulted. Russia was fine. They defaulted on their external debt, which is ordinary, but they defaulted on their internal debt, which I'd never seen. Like it, it, was a ruble, it was a ruble denominated debt, and you can print the rubles. So why would you default right. on your own stuff? But they did. They divided the currency, defaulted on the internal and the external debt. That started a global liquidity crisis, came around to LTCM. That started uh, 14 months earlier. It started in Thailand, Thailand in June of 1997, and it spread from Thailand to um, Indonesia, then to Korea. It was literally, you know, people use the cliche, cliche you know, investment, there's blood in the streets. There was real, yeah. real People blood forget the, the IMF were in Korea yeah. in 98. I mean, and people it's... got killed. I mean, there were riots and people got killed. But then in uh, kind of November, December, January, uh, November, December, 97, January, 98, it all calmed down. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, that's over. And they, even my colleagues at LTCM, they were like, well, how do we invest in Indonesia? It looks cheap, you know. But then it all came back again, April for other reasons, and then sort of uh, the, the storm hit in August, September. So that really took 14 months to come around. I go back to 07, uh, or uh, 2007, 2008. Now everybody remembers Lehman weekend, September 15th, 2008, you know, the AIG and the TARP and all that. That started in really June, July, uh, 2007. That started a year earlier. 
And even before that, you look at, uh, I think it was HSBC reported first quarter earnings in kind of April of 07, and they were weak based on mortgage write-offs. And then that was when the smart money said, oh, something's not yeah. right with this. And so that movie, The Big Short, and it portrayed it fairly well. Um, but then at the end of July, you had the blow up of the two Bear Stearns hedge funds. Then I think it was August 5th or 6th, somewhere in there, was when Jim Cramer went on that rant with yep. Aaron Burnett. They know nothing. They know nothing. So, um, and then it went from there, but then you had the super, but then it, again, it calmed down again. It calmed down in the winter of 07, and they got all the sovereign wealth funds to bail out all the banks. You know, Abu Dhabi bought Citigroup. Mm-hmm. Um, CIC, I think, bought Morgan Stanley, you know, somebody. And then, of course, the sovereign wealth funds got crushed. I mean, they lost 90% of those investments. So when 2008 came along, Paulson didn't even bother calling them because right. they, they, they'd had enough fun. Uh, but uh, but my point is that took 14 months to come around from J- July 07 to September 08. So the lesson of 98 and 08 is that these things don't happen every night. And one of the things I think investors suffer from, and I, I blame my friends at CNBC for this, it's what I call a two-second attention span. Yeah. We're so, you know, you say something, and if it hasn't materialized by four o'clock in the afternoon, you're an idiot, right? It's like, okay. Um, but um, so some memories are short. People are overly complacent. Uh, the lesson of those two prior crises is that it can take a year or so for the effects to, to play. So I'm watching Brexit very carefully. I think that the worst effects in terms of confidence and the kinds of things we've been talking about may play out in 2017, and even though the markets are kind of quiet at the moment. But do you, do you think, so for, to, to me, when I look at it, the, the ramifications of Brexit really have nothing to do with the UK. I, I, I think the UK is going to be fine. I really do. I think it's a major problem for Europe, and that's where the waves will flow out from, from Europe. Once we get the French elections next year, the Italian referendum in October of this year, then the German elections, there are so many pressure points on Europe, each of which is going to be strengthened, the force of which is going to be strengthened by Brexit, that I don't see how Europe gets through next year as is. I mean, do you share that view or do you think it will muddle through a bit longer? No, I, I, I disagree, but let me, I, I understand the thesis yeah. and I hear it a lot. And uh, I, uh, I always tell Americans um, that they don't understand Europe because they get their information from the English. And, uh, and the English hate Europe. So I said, anyone, anyone sitting there, anyone in America sitting there reading the Financial Times and The Economist has no idea what's going on in Europe because this is filtered through the English and the English hate Europe. So, uh, so that, that's, that's sort of one, actually, I take that seriously. You, you have to go to Germany, go to Italy, go to Spain, talk to locals, read the local press if you can, or get a good translation. You have to go into Europe to really get it. But the, I, I thought, I always thought that, um, the UK, but I'll say the English, because they were they, you know, because Scotland and Northern yeah. Ireland voted yeah. to to remain. Uh, but that's because they hate the English. Well, that's right. Well, that's <laughs> the thing. People don't get the UK. The UK right. is a sort of polyglot sort of thing. But but the UK, but specifically the English, um, wanted to leave Europe. And I'm not. I, I think they're better off without Europe, and Europe's better off without yeah. them. I'm all for economic integration and and let's remove barriers to trade and all that. To me, the divide, and this is just putting my lawyer hat on again, is the difference between civil law systems and the common law. And this is not well understood. Everyone's law, regulation, we hate regulation. Europe has a a code tradition. It goes back to the Code of Justinian in the uh, 6th century and the Napoleonic Code and what's coming out of Brussels today. And, And the European code mentality is if you have a problem, write a rule. And if it's still a problem, write another rule. And if it's still a little unclear, write another rule. And just keep writing rules until the problem goes away. And if you need another rule, do it. The English invented the common law, which is, okay, they've got laws, rules, and regulations, but the common law has what's called equity. And it gives judges discretion to, to it gives them wiggle room. You know, it's like, all right, yeah. I know what the strict law of contracts is, but you know what, you've really been treated unfairly. And you're really, this, your actions are unconscionable. You're, you're being treated very unfairly. Strict rule of contract says this, but I'm going to bend the rule a little bit to help you out. And, and that has been exported to the United States and Australia and Canada. So the common law tradition believes in wiggle room and, and a vaguely defined notion of equity. The civil law tradition is just keep writing rules. And this came home to me the week before Brexit. I was in Switzerland and I was in a bar. Uh, and Switzerland's not you know, in the, in the um, EU, but they're close enough. And, uh, 
And the bartender, bartender brings me a glass of wine and I'm with a, my daughter who's my business manager and a friend of mine. And there's a line on the glass and I look at it. It's got that little CE, yeah. it's like an official line. And it was like exactly three ounces of wine. And here was, I said, okay, so here's the EU telling the bartender exactly how much wine to put in the glass. Now, I like a tall pour. I, I like a bartender who gives me a couple of extra right. ounces. And I'll go back there, and if you shortchange me, I won't go back. So I have my own remedy for that. But I'm sure from the EU mentality, we're like, no, we want to treat consumers fairly. We're putting a line on the glass so that a consumer knows if there's like a half an ounce less than there should yeah. be. I'm sure it was well-intentioned. But I'm like, no, you're telling bartenders how to relate to their customers. In England, that would never happen. Yeah. And I think that's what the English it's, were it's rebelling against. They, like, we don't want lines on our glasses telling pub keepers how much beer to put in the glass. And, but but that, that's an anecdote, but that's the difference between a civil law system. And a, so they were never a good fit. And then, then the UK not joining the Euro just made, that, made this breakup inevitable. I actually think Europe will be stronger without the UK being a pain in the neck to them. And I think the UK will be better off without Brussels being a pain in the neck. So this is probably a good separation. So I actually think what's in, what's in common among Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, and others, well, I think that bond will actually strengthen without the UK constantly complaining about it, because they do share this yeah. They do share this tradition. Now, from the UK perspective, I'm not sure it, it's all good. I, I just gave you a long explanation as why I think they're better off. But I wrote an op-ed for, I won't mention the name, but a very prominent group. They, they, they chose not to publish it. I don't think they liked it. It was published elsewhere, so that was not a problem. But what I said is, I said, there are, I think there are two things that make sense for the UK. Stay in the EU and adopt the euro, or leave and buy gold. Right. But I think the worst path is to leave and not have gold, because the UK is now on its own. They don't have a soft call, because the European Central, well, the, 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 the European Union, European Monetary Zone, have 10,000 tons of gold. They have more than the United States, if you combine you know, Germany, France, Italy, and all that. The UK had a, I would call, soft call. Like, if they ever got in distress, because they don't have a lot of gold of their own, uh, and if Scotland leaves and joins the euro, they're going to have no gold, because I'm sure the Bank of England won't give it to them. But um, they kind of had a soft call on the 10,000 tons. Well, now with Brexit, they've lost access to that, even on an emergency basis. And you, you better go get some gold. So right now, to me, the pound sterling is levitating. It's it's because the US has got 8,000 tons. China's, who knows, four or five. Russia has the highest gold to GDP ratio of anyone except Europe. Uh, Europe's got plenty of gold, but the UK is out there with a, with a theoretically you know, reserve currency and no gold. If I were the exchequer or the Bank of England, I would be printing money and buying gold, because that's the two for you. You get to devalue your currency, help your balance of payments, and get gold all at the same time. But so I, I, I see a, a crisis in sterling coming. I'm not saying it's all good in Europe. Europe has lots of problems. You're absolutely right about it. But I see a crisis in sterling coming because they don't have the gold. I think Europe will actually be a little stronger without the UK. I hope they negotiate some trade deals. They're not at the back of the queue, as our president said. Uh, but I, uh, where I, so I may disagree with you a little bit on Europe, Grant, but I agree complete, uh, completely that the story's not over. So you bring up gold. I mean, it's, a, it's a good thing to get around to, uh, obviously. And you, you're one of the more high-profile guys who get the gold story and do a fantastic job of communicating it to people that wouldn't ordinarily get exposure to it. What's your take on the gold market right now, both from the, the official side that you touched on there, but also from the price action side, and we've, you know, we've had a four-year decline here, and sure. it's shaken a lot of people out. Yeah. Does this feel like we have found a bottom now? Do you, do you feel like it's, it's moving higher? It does, uh, and uh, I got some, uh, some learning on that from uh, Jim Rogers, you know, uh, one of the great commodity yeah. traders of all time, very savvy guy, and, and he made the point, he actually, uh, my conversation with him maybe a little over a year ago, uh, he said he's never seen a huge commodity run without a 50% pullback along the way. So you got to pick your entry and exit points and do the math and all that. But for gold to go from, uh, let's just take a, a $200 level in, in 2000, so it goes to 1900 okay? So that's a $1,700 run up. So um, a 50% drawdown would be down 850. So 1900 minus 850 takes you to 1050, Boom. and 1050 was the floor. And and Rogers said this to me when it was like 1200 or so. So he was he was you know ahead of the curve on that. So that 1050 was a 50% drawdown if you use 200 dollars as your base. 
And now it's it's got strength. What what impresses me about gold right now, Grant, is that it's 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 hanging in there in the face of a lot of headwinds. Because when people say gold, what they're really talking about is the dollar price of gold. See, the way I think of gold is money, and I think of gold by weight. I say, yeah, I've got you know, you got so many kilos or so many ounces or so many tons. I always think about gold by weight. To me, the dollar price of gold is just it's a cross rate. It's like you know, dollar gold, dollar euro, euro yen, dollar yuan. It's just if gold is money and these other things are money, the dollar's money, euro's money. It's just another cross rate. So when people say the dollar price of gold, they, they say gold's up. What they really mean is that the dollar price of gold is up. The way I think about it is the dollar's down. If, if the dollar price of gold is up, what's really happening is the dollar's being devalued. Now, there are a lot of reasons why the dollar price of gold should be down because we have high real interest rates and a stronger dollar. That's deflationary for the U.S. economy. That, all things equal, that means the dollar price of gold should be down, but it's not. So uh, so gold is holding up well in the face of headwinds. When we actually do get the weaker dollar, which I think will be very soon because the U.S. economy needs help, the dollar price of gold is going to scream. Then if we get a break, meaning a Brexit or a Turkish coup or a little somebody sinks a ship in the South China Sea, I mean, that's a long list. Sure. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be one of them. And it starts to scream. Then the momentum's going to build. And, and what's happened... Uh, as China was increasing its acquisitions, you know, the meme was gold's going from west to east. Well, it was going from west to east. You know, GLD was selling down, COMEX was selling down, you know, scrap in the, in the U.S. was being sold, and it was all going primarily to China, somewhat India and Russia, okay? Now, gold is flowing back to the west. And there's been some good research on this. Laurie Williams and, yeah. and others have done that. Um, and the Swiss actually have fairly good numbers. So the U.S., um, was one of the major export destinations for Swiss gold. UK was number one, that. US yeah. was kind of top three. So now the gold's going back to the West. Now, there's been a little bit of a slowdown in gold going to the East. Not, it hasn't reversed, the flow hasn't reversed, but this has gone down. So, so Eastern gold acquisition has gone down a little bit, Western gold has gone up. So the balance has been maintained, but just barely. Yeah. If Asia has a, has a bid, if they start increase their purchases, and the price starts to go up, and that's going to create momentum on the GLD. So they're both going up at once. There is not enough gold in the world. I've yeah. just, as I said, been to Switzerland. So they're going to be physical. There, are, there already are physical shortages. It won't take much in terms of Chinese acquisition to get the price going up substantially. That will feed on itself. Then West and, and East will both buy gold. Dubai is going to be a transshipment point. They'll run dry. Switzerland won't be able to get it. And then the price is going to run away. And that's when our friends who... Uh, are waiting, are going to say, get me some gold. And the shock will be they won't be able to get it. How, how does how does the, the dichotomy between the paper price and the physical asset resolve itself, do you think? Because they're two completely different things. And when people talk about gold, generally they're just talking about that piece of paper and a notional price on, a, on a futures contract. To me, I, I agree with what you say. This, it's, this, it's the physical that counts. The gold price doesn't really matter. It's the price of gold that really counts. Mm -hmm. How does that resolve itself without sharply higher prices that shock a lot of people. Well, it doesn't. You're not going to have two prices for gold. It's right. not like, you know, COMEX gold will be, you know, 1375 and physical gold will be 4000. That's not going to happen. Yeah. But what they'll do is they'll close the exchange. Yeah. Yeah, well, like when when that stress is is emerging and the warehouse is stripped bare and the shorts can't cover, it, they'll just close the exchange. So that's one way it will be resolved. But beyond that, you, you could see the price going up very significantly. But so it's it's really it's one market. It's it's one commodity. What the paper gold market does, it amplifies the physical. It's not different from the physical, but amplifies the physical. That's what leverage does. Yeah. That's what leverage is. And so when sentiment is bearish and sentiment is weak, and you know the shorts are having their fun, and the locals are just hey, I'm just rolling over and and, and taking money out of Contango, right? When when all that is going on the leverage in the paper market tends to amplify the weakness and amplify the bad sentiment. But the opposite is true. When gold starts going up on its own, for the kind of fundamental reasons we've been talking about, the paper market actually amplifies that. Yeah. So that's why I see it running away with one difference, which is you still need a little physical gold. See, the paper market is not a cash settled market. There are cash settled markets where I just write you a check. But COMEX allows for physical settlement. So as long as that's true, and it is true today, you're going to need some physical gold. When gold gets scarce over here in the physical market, you're going to have to close that exchange. And that will happen, and then that will cause a buying panic. And then my advice to people is, what are you waiting for? 
get, get your gold now. How do you think the governments react? If we do get this dislocation, everyone talks, about, well, there's no point in having it, the government will confiscate it. How does that part of this, if it gets to that, play out, do you think, this time around? Um, you know, when I hear people say, I'm not going to buy, I hear, I hear the story, but I'm not going to buy gold because the government will confiscate it. Yeah. To me, that's just a weak, ex you, yeah. you don't really want to buy gold. You're just trying to give me some story as to why you're not <laughs> buying it. And I've had that conversation many times. I've, I've spoken to people and they like, oh, I listened to you, I read your book, I get it, I'm going to go get some gold. Then you bump into them a year later, and I said, did you buy the gold? And they go, no. I said, well, okay, I, I get that. But um, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, I, there's a lot of human nature, there's a lot of denial, there's a lot of uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, elements in the mix as to why people will or won't do whatever. But uh, as far as the government's concerned, I don't, I don't think the government will confiscate the gold that people have. I think they will perhaps confiscate warehouses. Uh, they, may, they may freeze the gold of the Fed, say to you know, Germany and Netherlands, hey guys, we'll, we'll get back. We're going to keep the gold for now just in case. We'll get back to you. Here's a due bill or receipt. You, know, you can earn it back. Um, they may seize gold in warehouses at GFK. There's a lot of gold that Brinks and HSBC has. A, they may freeze all of that gold. Um, that, I think contracts will be terminated under force majeure clauses, early termination the clauses. They'll, They'll, they'll write you a check. See, what they'll do, they'll give you a check for yesterday's closing yeah. price. You're like, well, wait a second. It went up $500 an ounce today. I was like, well, sorry. We terminated you, closed the business yesterday. Here's your check. Like, but where's my contract? Sorry, it's done. Yeah. And I, well, then I call my dealer. Sorry, sold out. And you're like, gee, where's the gold? Uh, so, th so that's going to happen. So you really have to understand how exchanges work, how unallocated contracts work, how forward contracts work, you know, all of those elements and le how leasing works. And again, I'm putting my lawyer hat on because I'm enough of a geek that I've read exchange rule books. I know, I know that uh, exchanges have rules that say they can change the rules. There's actually a rule in yeah. the rule book that says, well, here are all these other rules, but there's this special rule that says we can do whatever we want if we, if we have to. And they use phrases like disorderly markets and you know, it's all legal and it's all there. So, um, so th there may be gold confiscation by government. I don't think they're gonna break people's doors down or you know, raid private vaults. Don't keep it in a safe deposit box in the bank. That's the first place yeah. to look. And, and don't rely on paper gold warehouses because those will be either stripped bare or locked down. Uh, you need it in private non-bank storage. And that's something I actually heard in um, Switzerland. I talked to one of the largest private secure logistics firms in the world in near Zurich. And they said they're actually running out of vault space. They're, they're having to acquire new vault space. And they said the gold is coming from UBS, Deutsche Bank, and Credit Suisse, that it, it's Swiss gold, it's not going anywhere else, it's the same owners, but it's coming out of bank vaults, going into private vaults for the reasons you, you refer to. So, uh, interesting times ahead, and uh, my, my advice to, uh, to interested parties is, you know, I, I'd recommend 10%, don't go overboard, don't, go, don't sell the ranch and buy 100% gold, but I think 10% will serve you well, but my other piece of advice is, get it now, don't wait. Jim, a great way to end. Thanks so much for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Grant.